Hello. Um, I'm sitting here with Lucille Jaffone. Um, we're going to record her oral history today in connection with the Our Streets, Our Stories oral history project here at the Leonard Library. Uh, so Lucille, um, I'm just very excited to be sitting here with you. Um, as you may be aware, you're like celebrity in this neighborhood. No, I'm not aware of that. <laughs> thank you so much for having yeah, me. Yeah, so John and others have said, yeah, Lucille, everyone knows Lucille. Who's John? John Moralia. Oh, yeah. okay, he was my neighbor growing <laughs> right. up. Right, um, which actually is a decent transition, if you don't mind. So you grew up on... Leonard Street. You grew up on Leonard. Right? Very funny he would say that because I was, I think I had the reputation for not knowing anyone in the neighborhood, so I sort of stayed in Manhattan more. Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't, I wasn't a Brooklyn girl at all. Okay, so you fled to Manhattan for comfort, whereas yeah, most so people much. do the opposite, me included, actually. <laughs> what do they do? They I come just, to Brooklyn? Yeah, I've, I'm much more comfortable in Brooklyn. Now, but then, we're talking about a different time. Nobody came to Brooklyn for comfort. <laughs> really? Well, can, we, can we start there? Would you, yeah, let's would you start talk there. about that a little sure. bit? Sure. Yeah. I didn't know about it as much as my parents, but they told me that the North Side was very dangerous, that mostly there were hoodlums and gangsters on the North Side. And my father was always fond of saying... Oh, now everybody's coming to the north side, and uh, there's lovers sitting across candlelight in the cafes. He said, when I was there, you're looking out the window in a restaurant making sure you don't get shot. <laughs> so, so it had a bad reputation. And as I wrote in that article about my landlady mm-hmm. on the north side, um, people didn't want to take me by, by taxi drivers. Nobody wanted to take me back. This was in the 80s? No. Okay. This, well, Before let the- me see. I was born in 51. So I was going to create the 50s and early 60s for you and tell you all okay. about that. But that would be great. So it was probably in the late 70s, early 80s, yeah, that nobody would take me back to the city. And they would always say, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, that's like the armpit of the world. I'm not going there, lady. How am I going to get back? <laughs> and I was always so shocked because I really just was a self-centered kid who wanted to get back home, you know. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> I didn't great. care if they got mugged. I don't know that anyone would consider that self-centered. Well, when you're 18, you look at things differently than when you're in your 60s. That's true. But um, so I was born on Leonard Street, and I had two siblings. And I was so lucky to have an extended family around the corner on Power Street. So that's actually where I live now. Um, both of my parents died, and some really very beloved aunts died. But I was thinking back when I found out that I would be doing this interview, and I thought. Um, there's so many wonderful memories. I guess maybe almost everybody says that about their childhood, you know. There's things that are gone forever, and so they become much more nostalgic about them. So I was going to create this whole neighborhood, which was the neighborhood I grew up in. Okay. That'd Williamsburg of 1951 to 1965. <laughs> um, the first thing I was thinking about was that the word yuppie didn't exist. <laughs> and now everybody's saying, you know, the yuppies. Right. And no one quite knows what they mean by that. Mm-hmm. They just mean anybody who wasn't born here, I guess. But um, then I was laughing at home thinking, well, hush puppies existed. And I was thinking about all the different shoes and Buster Brown. That was such a fun ad. Uh-huh. So Greenblatt's was the major shoe store in the area. And it was on Grand Street. And actually, in addition to Catherine's article, I wrote an article also for the Green Line on uh, a man who's now gone named Chick Brown. And his real name was Adolf, uh, but he didn't want to use that because of World War II and Adolf Hitler. And then he adopted the name Chick Brown because he uh, was a musician in a band. He was a singer. He's a wonderful man and very funny. He and my dad used to kid around all the time. Well, Chick owns a store on Manhattan Avenue off Morgia Street. And um, we would always go to Chick's. My mother, This is in the article. My mother would say, let's go see what dishes or pots we can find at Chick's. But that was venturing out. Now, I know this is going to sound really funny, but going anywhere toward Morgia Street was like forbidden territory because that's where the Hispanic gangs were, or so they were told. I don't think there really were gangs there, but... It was very dangerous, people thought. So it was a very segregated neighborhood. Grand Street one way was Hispanic, and you didn't go that way. Grand Street the other way was Italian, from Grand Street to Metropolitan Avenue. So north of Grand was was Italian, south of Grand. Okay, let's see. Pretty much so. And the Italian sections are actually quite small. It's between Grand and Meeker. That's about it, you know. 
So it's uh, always been like I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, you. no, no. Okay. Great. So it's but, always been like that. The Italian sections between Grand. And yeah, Grand. pretty much. I mean, okay. you know, we would venture over to DeLuca's Bakery was a big deal. It's now gone. Okay. And um, that was on. And where was that? Yeah. I mean, it's so funny. I lived there, and it became commonplace. And when I was a child, like most people, when you're a child, everything seems so far away and dramatic and larger than life. So to go to DeLuca's Bakery was like, we're going to that place on the corner. It's a great bakery, and you see the people baking. And was, uh, my aunts would always go there or send me. And it was on Havemeyer and North 6th. 6th or 7th. No, I think it was North 6th. So, yeah, it's pretty much always been that kind of a segregated little clumps. He has the Polish, he has the Italians, he has the Irish, he has the Hispanic. Um, so the first thing I remember is that Grand Street was like a big deal. It was like the Grand Street. It was the, the great street where all the shops were. And they weren't upscale, but they were fine quality. You didn't have any bargain stores there. That came in much later. The streets were packed. When I started thinking back, I thought, what happened? And I started thinking about what created that. The first thing was in the summertime, most people didn't have air conditioning. And television was around, but it wasn't like it is today. Like everybody watched TV all day long and stuff like that. It was really like, you know, you saw a favorite show or two and that was it. I remember coming home from school, you had to do your homework, you could watch a half hour program, then you would you know, go out and play, and then you might see another show a little bit in the evening, but it wasn't like you just sit there. And so without the air conditioning, TV not that important, there's no computers, people congregated outside. And that's where the community started. Mothers would sit outside and they would like, all meeting on the stoops. We didn't call them steps, we called them stoops, <laughs> as you probably know. And it was fascinating to remember that, like, the mothers were socializing with each other and the kids were playing, so they were watching their kids and socializing at the same time, just like, you know, like different groups do. But all the mothers would, like, be putting suntan lotion on <laughs> because it would be very hot. And the games we played were so uh, typical of what I think of as this period, except for one. I don't know if I made it up or other people made it up. I'm such a nature lover, so I don't really know where this game came from, but it was looking for ants in the cracks in the side. <laughs> and we'd spend hours. We'd have little sticks, and we'd try all the cracks and say, you saw three ants over there? We never took them. We just wanted to <laughs> ant watch. <laughs> that really does sound like I don't that honestly, to me, that sounds like a depression era game where it's just like we don't have anything. Left right, to look it for. sounds like you have one cold bus off. This is post World War Two. Oh is like yeah, booming Brooklyn, yeah, right? like a, yeah. It was middle class, working class families, and you stood by each other. You helped each other out. It was almost like you know, in the honeymooners when they yell up and downstairs. <laughs> You know, Trixie, I got this here for you. Like, it's just everybody was out there, and everybody knew everybody. So looking for ants in the sidewalk cracks was a big specialty. Mm-hmm. And the was, jump rope was big. I remember when Double Dutch started. I couldn't do Double Dutch. I couldn't jump it, and it was like, oh, my God. I'm <laughs> missing out on the new fad. Roller skating was big. Kids were roller Hordes of kids would be roller skating up and down the block. We never crossed the street. We were too young. Um, I remember everybody had a skate key. I don't know if you remember that, but like you had to tighten your skate, especially the part that goes over your toes. So um, we would lose hours in there. But they, who has the skate key? No, Eugene, let's go get you. <laughs> Jew, we need a skate key. And everybody would just be yelling and talking and having fun. That's so funny. So, I, it's it's just so great. I remember I've, I've read novels where they refer uh, to the skate key. I never, oh, you have? I never understood what that meant. <laughs> and it was in that context, too, like. Who has a skate key? I, I lost my skate, skate key. Skate. Yeah. Um, so what is that actually? Like that's just... I don't know why the, the skates... The laces would, would tighten with it. They, no, there was a little piece on the side, as I recall, and you tightened the clamps. I don't remember if there were laces or not. Some of them might have had like two pieces that come along and meet in the middle. Mm-hmm. And maybe there was a lace too, but I don't know. But the thing is, is that why would they get loose? I mean, we weren't skating that hard I can't imagine you know right. but who knows I don't remember that part but I just remember that that skate key was so important 
So that's just another thing that that's so interesting. Like, refer, like uh, references the community atmosphere. Everyone playing the same game. Everyone exactly. The same needs. Exactly. And there was no sense of like. You were a sheep or you were a follower. Or nobody was nobody was bored. Mm-hmm. It was really interesting to think back that, you know, I don't remember saying we're bored. Huh. And we had a lot of fresh air, mm-hmm. you know. So there was the skating, the jump rope, uh, looking for the ants, <laughs> red light, green light, one, oh, two, three. Light, I, you know I, that yeah, game? Yeah, yeah. We spent hours playing red light, green light. Yeah, I, I, you know, I grew up on that game too, actually. Oh, you did? Yeah, when my it's mother taught less. us. Actually, she taught everybody... On my street that I grew up on, and we'd play red light, green light. Uh-huh. Um, anyway, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Where did, we, where did you grow up? This was in Florida. Oh, um, my goodness. Red light, green light, one, two, three, you got to Florida. Yeah, <laughs> yeah red <laughs> light, green light. Made it. And we played this other game that my mom taught us, Mother May I. Where uh-huh. You could take certain, took uh-huh. certain steps. You could take umbrella steps, which actually sounds interesting, and I don't know what it refers to now. But, Probably bigger steps, step. yeah. 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 Um, there was also... Um, a lot of hand clapping games like Miss Mary Mac. Oh, yeah. But that was when I was a little older. Yeah. Yeah. Um, chalk on the sidewalk was really big, drawing, mm-hmm. and hopscotch. We played hopscotch forever, and it was like sometimes we just played it straight, and sometimes we just fooled around and just kept jumping all over the place and didn't pay attention to the rules. So um, the kids were out everywhere. Everyone was in the streets. And then um, as I got older and I would go to Manhattan, I liked ballet, theater. My uncle, one of the extended family members around the corner, and now my two aunts would take us a lot to the theater. So we were very lucky. Most of the people that I grew up with didn't go to Manhattan very often, you know, unless they were working there as they, when they were older. Mm-hmm. Um, so... I remember when I was about 15 or 16 hearing that people were hiring a bus to go to the theater. And I was like, hiring a bus? It was a big event. And it's kind of interesting that it's so close. Kind of like a tree grows in Brooklyn when Francie's, you know, thinking it's, oh, across the river. And it's so close, but to her it's another world. It's another kingdom. Right. You know, and... and, um, that book, you know, I, mean, I guess most people know that book was from around here mm-hmm. and all those streets were named. I remember, I was an adult, I was in my 30s at least, when uh, this library uh, had a filming, a showing of the film. And it was so nice. People from the community came and it was really a gathering to see it. And it was great seeing it in the very same library. And I remember this library when it was... Um, the old style with the panels, the beautiful woodworking. Really? Yeah. Before they... When when they modernized it, I, I almost died. I walked and I went, ah, they ruined the whole thing. What happened? It was like a bomb had come and made it modern. <laughs> <laughs> a new kind of bomb. An ugly bomb. Yeah. <laughs> the ugly bomb. Yeah. And I'm used to it now, and it's cheerful, but when I think back, it was so warm and inviting. Yeah. Did you see pictures of it? I've Is seen that pictures. How you... We have a little yeah. display at the entrance, which has some pictures that we have stored in our archive in the Brooklyn collection. Mm. But you know, and then there's been a few branches that they've you know out out in Bushwick and at other in other parts of the system where they've tried to restore them back. You know, they mm. made these kinds of. I guess it's a recording, so people can't see me gesturing. But <laughs> they made these kinds of adjustments where they dropped the ceiling and right. put in all this fluorescent lighting, you know, and right. covered up all the beautiful wood paneling. But then when they re- renovated again, you know, with modern heating and ventilation systems, they're able to bring the ceiling back up. And you know. we sold our father's house recently, and on the Leonard Street house that we grew up in. And we had tenants there on the second floor. It was a two-family house, and so I never really went into their apartment a lot. I know them very well. <clears throat> so when we sold, they weren't there any longer. And um, I opened a closet. It was uh, about three shelves in a closet built into the wall. And the ceiling was typical like this, acoustical tile dropped. Mm-hmm. And I looked up, and there was a tin ceiling. Yeah. And I thought, oh, how beautiful. The, the, <laughs> the Design was so gorgeous, and I thought, why would anyone cover this up? And tin ceilings are so, you know, sought after now. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this was the 50s, and the 50s had its style. Every, you know, few decades has to change. 
So then I was thinking that while the mothers were putting suntan lotion on in the afternoons, the fathers were going out at night playing cards because it was hot and they wanted something to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And they um, drank beer and occasionally they would go to the bookie. Do you remember? Do you know about the bookies? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Uh Because OTB wasn't around at that point. It wasn't legalized gambling. So there was just a guy in the neighborhood who was the the bookie. Yeah, it was a bad deal, you know, going to a bookie and putting a bet on a horse and that was bad. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) But it was, well, but everyone was doing it? Oh, yeah, it was done. I mean, I don't think everyone, but a lot, mostly a lot of people were doing it, yeah. Well, so even that, even like, we'll call that like vice, basically. (laughs) Even that had a community element to it? Absolutely. You know, I think that the more we talk about it, the more you realize. I knew it was community, but it's so embedded. And I don't know. It's Hispanic people, Spanish people have that, and Italians, the Mediterranean people seem to have that in their culture, but I don't know how much of it is, you know, was it that way in Greenpoint with, among the Polish or the mm-hmm. Irish? I don't know, but I suspect it was. I don't think it's just an ethnic thing. I think it was the time period. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting you know. to consider. Yeah. I, uh, I, I'm interested, just kind of got me thinking about it, in like the divisions between the neighborhoods that you uh-huh. referred to. And when you speak about them from your perspective as a, a young girl right. in, in the 50s, you speak about them as being so as being very, quite defined. And I, and I can very. understand that because it does, does come down to things like, you know, you can't cross the street, it's too busy, yep. you know, and following right. the directives of your parents. It was very foreign land. It was, I remember thinking, you know, it was like... When I moved to California when I was an adult, my mother was so upset I was moving away. And, my, you know, people didn't live that way. Now everyone's traveling, living all over the place. Mm-hmm. If you live in another country, it's not such a big deal. But they, they, it was like I was going to Afghanistan, so, and they would never see me again. My father was dying. <laughs> he was like... <laughs> can, I, I, can I ask, like, well, so what, did, what, what, what took you out to California specifically? I always wanted to travel, and I became a travel agent. And when I was a travel agent, I got these some small free trips, and I went to California. And I had met some people here in New York who were living in New York who were originally from San Francisco, a married couple. So I stayed with them, and I wanted to do everything. So this was in the 70s that you left for California? Yes, 78 to 83. 82, I left. I stayed in California. I was in San Francisco and then Palo Alto. Ah, Okay. I changed jobs, I changed departments, I changed everything on a regular basis. I was always like, oh, I think I'll do that. Big, grand scale. Um, So, the other memories I have of my block, Leonard Street in early Brooklyn in the 50s and early 60s, is that um, people took care of each other and the kids took care of each other. I remember losing my brother one day. And it was like he had said, the blocks are delineated, don't go past this street or that street. Well, we're on Leonard Street, and our house was between Manhattan, I mean, I'm sorry, our house was between Ainsley and Powers. And my brother did the worst thing, he went around the corner onto Ainsley. And I never thought of going on Ainsley, because we weren't supposed to go on that block. We were supposed to stay on Leonard Street, and that's where we lived, and that's where we stayed. So when I got to Ainsley and I saw him down the block, I knew the person's house he was standing in front of. He was only four. I screamed at him. I said, get over here. You're going to get me in trouble. What are you doing on Ainsley Street? It was like a big deal. And then when I learned to cross Leonard Street, that was freedom because across the street where Champ's Restaurant is now mm-hmm. was Gooch's. Doesn't, Gooch's? That sound, doesn't that sound hilarious? Yeah. How do you it's, spell that? You well, we, yeah, we spell the G-O-O-C-H. And I don't know where that name comes from because they were Italian, so it must have been Guccini or something like that. I have no clue. Oh, okay. But it was Pat Gucci. And when Cham started renovating, mm-hmm. because Funzi, Pat's son, who's now an old, you know, like about my age, he still owns that building, I believe, and he rents it out to Cham. So yeah. when Cham started coming, first of all, to have a vegan restaurant. You know, right. moved in across the street from where I grew up. It was so unbelievable because I was vegan for like 13 oh, really? years. Yeah. Oh. I'm still vegetarian. And it oh. was like. So that's great. Actually. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, the moon is coming to me. You know, it's like, this that's is amazing. Funny. So when they were renovating, I went in there and I had such a flash. I was standing in this empty wooded space and I had this flash of Pat Gooch's and the Leonard Street entrance where they're cooking now at, mm-hmm. at Cham's, was the candy store. 
And there you would have, I'd have to go buy cigarettes from my mother, and I'd get an egg cream. You know, and then at that point in time, there were no eggs and egg creams. Mm. But it was so delicious with chocolate syrup and milk and seltzer. So and so delicious. Were there no eggs in it because it was post the, the war? I don't know. Okay. I, I don't know because I asked my mother once uh-huh. and her friends, and they didn't remember a time when there were eggs in it either. Huh. So it must have been very early on. Yeah. I mean, maybe there was still a shortage of, of Maybe. Goods. That would be interesting to look up on the web to see when eggs left egg cream. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Google, <laughs> when did the egg leave the egg cream? <laughs> so it was chocolate syrup, milk, and seltzer, and we would have at least three a day. And so for me to go to Pat's across the street was so uh, exhilarating. It was such a sense of freedom when I learned to cross. And, of course, we crossed in the middle of the street between cars, which was, like, the worst thing to do. But that's, there was no why well, walk to the corner. So the cooking section of Champs was the candy store of Pat Gooch's. And then you had open access, just like now. And that whole restaurant was a grocery store. And there were three aisles. And you really had to be thin to get through those aisles. And they were covered with boxes and canned foods. And then you'd have a deli against one wall where the counter is now. And I remember buying sandwiches for my family there all the time. And even as I was a young working girl going to the subway to go to work in Manhattan, I would pick up a sandwich at Pat's. So it was a real institution for this little area. Let's see what else. Did it have a, can I ask? So did yeah. it have like a little lunch counter where you could sit? Or was it just a... The a candy thing? store had stools candy store had with a counter. Okay. Well, there's so many memories. There was all these guys who would hang out in the street. I thought they were all so handsome because I was like about (laughs) 10 or 12, and they were like, you know, I mean, I don't know how old they were. I want to say 19, but to us, they looked like 35, and they were like local guys, you know, and I would love to have met them, not now because they'll be too old or maybe (laughs) dead, but I would love to have met them years later to see what they were really like, Uh you know. Because, as I said, you glamorize everything so much when you're a kid. And everything's right. so big and great. Yeah. And I used to do twirling batons with my friends. And that was a big thing, to be a majorette. Mm-hmm. A lot of girls wanted to do that. Um, Did you do it with school or just on your, on your own? Oh, no, on our own. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We just go banging our elbows all over the place, twirling our batons through the streets. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, I wanted to say... I was talking about sitting out and being out. The summers, obviously, were different than the winters. So I was right. thinking back, and I thought, well, the big thing was that everybody was in beach chairs if they were on the sidewalk or they were sitting on the stoops. And you would come home. I would come home at, like, 10, 30, 11 from Manhattan by subway. I would think nothing of it in the summertime. Everyone was out. Right. I'm talking about, like, maybe 20, 30 people sitting out on a block. And on every block, eating pizza till 11 and to midnight. You know, it was just sweltering, and it was just like everybody was out there. And so you felt so safe and so happy. You know, you'd wave to friends, but you also felt like you were being looked over constantly. Because as a young woman dressed up going down the street, right. all these older people would be going, oh, Amstern, oh, look at her. And then, or they would just stare at you, and I was like so shy and embarrassed. Like, oh God, everybody's looking at me again. Sometimes I would say hello if you know, I didn't know them. But I don't know if you know. You, I'm sure you've heard about the Nalokia, the evil eye. Mm-mm. Oh my God, it's such a study. Mm-hmm. It's a Mediterranean belief. It's in all the countries: Spain, Portugal, Italy, Greece, Turkey, they North Africa. Them. They call it the Malokia? The Malokia, yeah. Okay. M-A-L-O-C-C-I-A. Okay. And there are many books written on it. And my brother just went to Turkey, and he got me a little charm, which is an eye with circles around it, and it's supposed to ward off the evil eye. Okay. So my grandparents, I mean, my whole family heard of it. My aunts believed in it, and my grandmother believed in it. And it's it's quite benign, actually. I don't think it's that terrible a thing, but... They used to learn prayers to take away the evil eye, and supposedly my grandmother knew this. And it would be like if you got a really bad headache that wouldn't go away, or you had some kind of indigestion, or you vomited. They'd say, somebody gave you the evil eye. And what it means is is that you are looked over. 
So when I first heard that, I thought it was like you were ignored. But it isn't. It's that you're looked at in an envious way. But they don't necessarily mean bad intent. So I don't understand if the person is in malevolent why you would get a headache. But, right. <laughs> but it would be like, I'm, like for instance, if you were walking down the street or you came in here and I'd look you over and I'd look at your shirt and your pants, and, mm, he's dressed really well. And a little jealousy, a little like, hmm, let me check him out. Okay. Mm. So when I was coming home from the subway, I was always, you know, I didn't know about the evil eye except what I heard from my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And she only spoke Italian, so I didn't really understand much of what she said. But I... Um, I would say, oh, I wonder if they're giving me the evil eye or not. <laughs> and it's still, it's because I've worked with a lot of Italian-Americans and Italians from Italy in the last years in the daycare, and they believe in it. And some of their parents do the formula. You put oil and water, and you watch the pattern. It's all kinds of ways. My grandmother used to say prayers and pull it out of your head and, th <laughs> and throw the evil force out the window like getting it out of you and getting it out of your house. So it's sort of an old world thing that was carried on here. Huge and old world superstition, yeah. So is it <clears throat> is it mostly that other generation that keeps it going now, or is it something that was passed on to the, like, well, it's to a, like your generation? No, no, I wish I, I wish I could learn it. I mean, you can learn it. It's nothing difficult to learn how to It just didn't ward it fully off. take... When no, they didn't pass it on. It was my grandmother's generation. My mother doesn't know it. My my aunts didn't know it. But they believed in it. Yeah. My aunt came home from a party once with a terrible headache, and my grandmother did shoo, 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 whatever she did, the prayer, throw it out the window, and my aunt healed immediately. <laughs> now, how much of that is true, and how much of it is suggestion on my, you know, to my aunt? But I know young people who believe in it young people like in their 30s and 20s and I know people my age who can do it but not mostly not it's a very small group of people who hang out together I asked someone to teach me and she said I had to go to her house at midnight on Christmas Eve and I'm sleeping at midnight on Christmas Eve <laughs> and I didn't want to walk around by myself going to learn prayers to ward off evil <laughs> okay. Man, well, I'm really fascinated in this. I'll have to stop myself from... No, from it's a fascinating... I was, too, when I first learned about it. It's a yeah. fascinating topic. And if you start reading the books, it is so prevalent. Yeah. Well, so do you have any idea of like, what the source of that is in Italian culture? Or, I guess, specifically Italian, since we're talking about your grandmother? Well, and I was more interested in what the source of it is, period. Like, right. did it start in Italy? Did it start in Greece? Is it ancient? Mm -hmm. And I don't know, and I, that's another thing that you'd really have to find the right books for the history of the evil eye. So, well then let's, I guess, let's focus maybe on how it felt for you, or what your notion of it was, especially, because I'm picturing you, you know, walking down the street, and, you know, you've got your whole community there, who've watched you grow up, and now you're right. wearing dresses, coming home from the subway right. by yourself, like, right. as it seems like there would be kind of... They probably like, thought I was a snob. Or, you know, or, yeah, or, like, you were kind of talking about maybe a certain envy of your, mm -hmm. your freedom with which you were going about. But there's also, maybe. I guess, that kind of watching over you element. You Absolutely. Know? And they probably, some of them knew who I was and some of them didn't. But from my perspective, it was all a jumble because they're here with these people who were strangers basically looking at me and you know I kind of didn't know I was shy at that time not super shy but you know as you're a younger person you're just sort of feeling your way in the world and I was much shyer than I am now so um so this is like when you were coming back from Manhattan Manhattan so this I'm is not 19, 20 you know years old okay so this is like the early 70s yeah yeah, and through a long time, through the 80s even, yeah. you know. But it's still the same people out, like, in the, oh, like, yeah. in the chairs. Oh, yeah, everybody lived in this. Until recently, everybody who lived in the houses lived there for generations, mm -hmm. yeah. I was the, the only one, I was the only one on my block, I think, the only girl on my block that I, well, some of them moved away to, like, Long Island, who didn't get married and who didn't move into the house next door or the house around the corner. Mm. And I was always in Manhattan. So I was, and my brother too, and we were like very independent and worldly, and I think they looked at us in a very different way. We weren't really that close in community. Mm. This is later on when we were adults. Mm. 
you know, how, how old, travels. What's and, the age difference between you and your brother? Uh, four years, four and then years. my sister's four years younger than my brother. Okay, so four he's younger space. than you. So I'm you're, the oldest. You're the oldest, okay. Yeah, right. So the Malokia was just a part of like thinking, oh, I wonder if they're giving me the evil eye. It was just something you heard. I wasn't frightened, mm -hmm. but it was mysterious. Because yeah. I really didn't understand the evil eye then. Right. I hadn't read anything about it. And I hadn't asked people about it. It was right. like, oh, yeah, they look you over. Oh, yeah, they look at that. They, they looked, somebody looked at her today. I thought somebody looked at her. Everybody looked at you all day long. I couldn't figure out what they were talking about. Seems like it really worked, though. Kind of, you know, like it just as a, as a, as a tool to kind of keep you on your toes <laughs> and keep you kind of wondering who's looking at you, or and that there's always eyes around. It seems like it maybe it worked to keep you, yeah. keep you in line, keep you. Um, there's a poem. I'm trying to think of the name of it now. Um, the little yeah. The little green eye of the yellow god is a repeated line in the poem. I don't know. I can't remember who wrote it. I have a whole t bunch of tapes of poetry. But also, um, it's in a lot of the stories, like uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. If you touch a sacred object, if you dispo you know, displace something, a lot of mystery and mysteriousness and power to certain things. And in mm -hmm. this case, the Maloki is the power of someone to undo you without you knowing it. Mm -hmm. So I think it was a very, you know, society where they wanted to be on guard all the time to make sure that you were okay. Right. And they, one was okay. But do you feel like it, for, for your grandmother, it had its roots in Catholicism growing up? Or did she grow up Catholic? Oh, very. Yeah. So this was just kind of, this was like a cultural element that was, yeah. you know, on top of growing oh, up. Oh, definitely. And it was, I mean, it's probably a pagan belief mm -hmm. before it became Catholic, but it's definitely got inherited. Right. Just like the Giglio. Yeah, I think you were the one who actually talking had about told that. me about that. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, I but I'd love that. for you to, oh. to talk, talk again, because I forget what the, what the, what the roots Symbols of that. Symbols are. Right, yeah. Well, when I was young, the Giglio was like, oh, we're going to that crowded feast, and all we wanted to have is cotton candy, and I didn't really understand the Giglio at all. It was just mm -hmm. like, the tower gets brought down the block, and everybody screams, and the men are going, da 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 I thought, whoa, it was really scary. <laughs> it was all these men with these scaffoldings on their shoulder, and they were big and burly, and uh -huh. they hugged and kissed and cried. And I mm -hmm. never saw men kiss before, and it was like, wow, what is this? It's such an authentic recreation. Right. As I got older, I started to understand it more, and I would bring friends from Manhattan, and I would love watching my friends because they would be, like, leaning up against buildings, crushed because it's mobbed, mm -hmm. and their eyes would be popping out. And just like, what have I seen? The last time I went was about two years ago, and I took a friend from Manhattan, and she had never heard of it before, and she thanked me a hundred times. She said, I don't think I would ever understand or know this, or this is so amazing. It's really like a European festival, mm -hmm. you know. So the story is that, I hope I don't butcher this, I hope some of the real Italians don't hear me go, what's she talking about? <laughs> um, there was this bishop named Paulinus, Paulinus, and he rescued the town of Nola, which is in southern Italy, from the Saracens. How he did that, I don't know. I don't remember, but he, it was a symbolic going out to meet the bishop when he came back to Nola. And when they went out to meet him and thank him, they brought lilies in their hands to give to him. So the Giglio, the word Giglio means lily. I could never figure out where the lily was because it's a, you know, a paper mache tower. Right. It's white, but and on the top of the tower is St. Paulinus, the bishop who became saint. Now, when we had our meeting, I was speaking to some people about it, the other Lucille and a few people, and they said that this is still done. I had heard that it was not done, but when I was young, the tower would be at one end of a block, and maybe like North 10th or something, North 9th, North 10th, and have a mire, and like down from the main entrance of the church of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Men would carry this gilio, this tower, on a scaffolded base, and they would all be lined up. And they, there's a whole, you know, like kind of society of these people who bring it from generation to generation. Your father was a carrier, and mmm. you know, your grandfather was, and you. It's a very big honor. Were so they it's always a group. 
Did, did they always were they always members of the club that meets over there on Oh on Larmer Street? Yeah. I don't know. I mean I, I saw when that club first opened, so I don't think it was always right. the members. But they were all they're all members, members of the of group. The church. Yes, and then a society. It's a called a society of they call the capo right. the main night. Well there also was in the corner of my, behind Mount Carmel's church, down the block toward Meeker, a boat with men dressed up as pirates and Saracens, you know, the Eastern influence. Mm-hmm. And men, and that would be on scaffolding also, and men would carry the boat. So the boat is coming down one block, and the Giglio is coming down the other block. It was very, very exciting. When were they going to meet? Mm-hmm. And I was standing there one day. I hope not too many people listen to this tape. <laughs> I was standing there one day when I was, like, probably in my 30s, 20s. And I thought, this is a pagan ritual. This is, you know, a, re- a birthing thing. This is a sexual enactment. Mm-hmm. There's a phallic symbol on the boat. And everybody's screaming. <laughs> I thought, wow, I could imagine what this was like, you know, in the British Isles and in France and Spain and, and you know, well, like the 12th century or something. They had so many rituals. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, I don't know, maybe even earlier than the 12th century. But it was definitely interesting to think of how much overlay there is between what was before, what we call pagan, but it's like pre-Christian, and then when the Christian societies came. So I look at it both ways, and it's very fun, and it's really fun to look at the people watching it. Because yeah. the first timers, you know, when they come, they, their mouths are open, they're looking up in the air, and they're like, "Wow, what is this?" Yeah. And I didn't know. And they didn't know that this existed right here in New York. Yeah. You know. It's a. I mean, it's a really special thing. It's a big uh, deal. Uh, but so, so when you were growing up, it was kind of mysterious, and you didn't. Did you? Did were you, you raised on the? Were you raised on the the? the the legend of it or how it came to be or did you figure it out later when you uh, my aunts told me a little bit but they didn't know that much themselves mm-hmm. I don't think and it was, mostly everybody went with the zeppels and the uh, zeppelis right. and, and, and the yeah. food and the cotton candy and, and the, the ferris wheel and yeah. we played you know at the bazaar right. mean, they'd spin the wheel you'd have your money on the number and it's like you might have won something um, but those pictures of the men Holding mm, up the uh, holding up the Giglio. yeah, they're really intense, and it must have really, you know, meant something to be one of those. One oh, of those it's people. a big honor yeah. for them. Yeah. So, so I wonder, you know, how much of the the story was was just out there, you know, in the in the community, and how much like they latched onto it, if it was just the tradition of it. Well, no, I think the story was always clear to many people, mm-hmm. but. Um, I don't know when Mount Carmel's church started publishing the story in a little booklet when they advertised the Giglio, but I, you know, because I wasn't around a lot and right. I didn't pay it. I was, right. a friend of mine told me you were always in the other room. And <laughs> I was, I was always a little bit off center from really what's happening here. I was doing my own thing. So I don't, I would think about it. I was in my 30s or maybe even 40 when I found the the pamphlet. I said, oh, this is an interesting story. I said, this is really an incredible reenactment. You know, right. um, so here the, the Saracens are in their boat, and Paulinus comes out, and he stops them, and everybody is grateful, and he gives, they give them lilies, and so the lilies come out. So, I guess if it looked more like a lily, I'd be happier. <laughs> <laughs> right. But that's the story. The other story that I remember that was also mysterious, and I'd only have a bit of this story. I only have a, a little. Well, I don't. I can't give you all the facts because I was like, uh, I was, and I still am, a major dumbbell when it comes to sports. I hate all sports that all the men love. So you have baseball and basketball and football and soccer and no, I don't know what else. So um, we don't have rugby, but you know they're crazy there too about rugby in Europe. So there was the World Series. And we had the Dodgers, and this is before the Dodgers went to California. And I remember them saying how every year, I was young, I might have been eight, how every like year... 59, something Yeah, like that. Okay. it was definitely the 50s or early 60s, and so every year an effigy is hung. Right. Do you know about this? For the World Series? Yeah. No. Oh, I thought you said, yeah, I thought maybe you could tell me more oh, about it. <laughs> no, I don't. I, wait, I'm not. A, it's still done to this day? No, 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 oh, no, okay. no. No, this was when I was a kid. I don't know when well, what it was stopped. The effigy? 
it was, you know, just a stuffing, like a uh, scarecrow. Like a straw was, man. Um, yeah, it was somebody, it was a white sheet with a rope tied around to make a waist and to make arms and everything. And it represented the losing team. Oh. Were the Yankees going to hang the Dodgers or were the Dodgers going to hang the Yankees? Oh, so this was Dodgers Yankees World Series? Yeah. Okay. Well, I could definitely figure Dependent, out what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> I knew nothing. Uh-huh. I had never gone to a game. I never watched a game on TV, and I was always like, oh, how boring. So I went out, and I saw this effigy. I had never seen the effigy before hung, and everybody was cheering, and there was confetti all over the blocks. Everybody said, the Dodgers hung the Yankees. Now, I don't know if that's true. Maybe the Yankees won. I remember them <laughs> saying the Dodgers won. Uh-huh. <laughs> so you could look it up and find out okay. yeah, when, I'll, I'll if the Dodgers up. won the pennant. And <laughs> Maybe I can find a picture of the effigy, too. Like oh, that like would be interesting. Yeah. Well, this effigy was on Leonard and Ainsley hanging on the lamppost. Okay. <laughs> and it was quite a thing for me. I was like, wow, that's really cool because it was an artistic creation, right. you know, to see this made body. And then, you know, at Halloween, there would be the chalk and the sock. Do you know about that? Everybody would be hitting you as you go by, and so you got chalk all over you. And sometimes they would throw eggs at you. Okay. I know about that. And it was so but dramatic. That, one, that one's scary enough. Right. <laughs> Everything was so dramatic. It was sort of like, I don't know what the parents were thinking because I was looking at it from my child perspective, but they were mad that people got eggs thrown at them. And they said, oh, they're wasting eggs, they're right. wasting food, yeah. and they're making, look at the mess they made on Bobby's shirt or whatever it is, you right. know. And to us, like, getting an egg on you or having an egg thrown on you was like, I don't know, like committing a murder. It was like you were this victim of this terrible thing. You said, oh, she, had the, she got the egg on her today. Oh, how horrible. Oh, I'm so sorry for you. It was very dramatic uh-huh. over nothing. Yeah. Well, so who were these bad kids throwing the eggs? Right. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but I have a funny story. I don't know if Eugene will actually be uh, an interviewee here. He's a wonderful guy. I grew up. On Leonard, and they grew up across the street. Uh, Patricia, his sister, Mm -hmm. is four years younger than Eugene. Mm -hmm. So we became friends. I was friendly with Patricia and Mm -hmm. Eugene a little bit. Eugene is one of these Renaissance men Mm -hmm. who is now a doctor living in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And he would always have these great stories. And he would tell them in this loud voice and laugh through it. And he was standing outside with a couple of friends on Leonard Street. And a whole bunch of young teenage boys came over. I think they were Hispanic. And they said, you know, hey, move, man, because we're taking over your block. And Eugene said, okay, fine, take it. I don't want it. And so there was always a little tension. You'd always hear little stories about gangs, and they were coming, but they never came. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, don't, I think they were, it was really hyperbole. Yeah. It wasn't West Side Story. It right. wasn't like that. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, it's, it's funny that the those neighborhood divisions that we were talking about before, that they right. still are, kind of exist. They you know, exist. They're kind of, well, you know, yeah. they def- the community still exists, but I think that the, yeah. you could draw the neighborhood lines almost, you know. You could. I mean, I guess people yeah. have tended to, I mean, I guess people have moved into all the different portions of, you know, Williamsburg and Greenville. Well, now the young people have moved in any, yeah. everywhere, but. Right. The north side is a little bit more shared. It's Polish and Italian. Mm-hmm. But the south side is all Hispanic. Greenpoint is predominantly Polish mm-hmm. with an earlier f- Irish grouping. Mm-hmm. The Irish is still there, but I think it was more heavily Irish earlier on, and I don't know exactly how when that's shifted. Like 40s, 50s was more Irish. And then what they're calling the Graham Shopping Area, which is our area between Meeker and Grand Street, um, is Italian, and then again on the other side of Grand Street, uh, Moja Skulls, and so it was, you know, formerly and still basically Spanish. So they're very delineated, yeah, but people walk everywhere. I go to Trinity Church at times, and that's on Montrose, and I don't think anything about it, mm-hmm. you know, but before, if I were to step off the corner of Grand Street heading toward Moja, people would go, like, come back, come back, where are you going? Mm-hmm. It was very prejudiced. Okay. Oh, yeah. I mean, because Chick said that he moved further. I don't know where his first store was, and then he said he brought it in. He said when he was on Morgan Street, you know, he worried about if his business would thrive, if his customers would still come, because they had it across Grand Street. So phenomenal to think about it, really. Did he move because the rent was cheaper? 
on was it was Mosher in Manhattan? Is that yes? Right? Okay. Yes, possibly. I don't remember. I'd have to look at the article. See if he even told me that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, the feeling that you're describing, it, you know, it's 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 similar to me because I think it's the way you feel when you're when you're growing up any place. You know, I think so. But but you know, there's Brooklyn, always something taboo and always something. Yeah, gray, and you, know. you always kind of mark territory by places that you've had experiences in. Like this, right. is, the, this is the furthest corner for, for me and. Right. But you know, in Brooklyn, it the neighborhoods are kind of set up that way. Right? They are like the, the borders are these these streets, these, and streets. these shops because you know they're lined with places that you go, and there's right. no real reason to go past them. Well, there's actually one exception was St. Mary's Church because mm-hmm. that's on Leonard and Morgia. Well, okay. not now; it's demolished. Oh, right. it's in the process of being demolished, but. I went to St. Mary's went to school, school, and I went to St. Mary's Church as a parish when I was growing up. So St. Mary's got demolished? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, um, the school closed a long time ago. I don't have a date for you when the school closed, mm-hmm. but I'm going to say, like, I graduated there in 59, I think, 56, 59. I would say probably somewhere in the 70s it must have closed. If not before, I, you know, I didn't have to find that out. But the church closed in 2008. The announcement came, so all the parishioners were going to say to um, Holy Trinity, which now was going to be known as Most Holy, was called Mo, Most Holy Trinity, Most Holy Trinity, and Saint Mary's the Immaculate Conception, because they merged. The parishes merged. Yeah, and um, my father was yelling. That's ridiculous. How are these old people going to walk over to Montrose Avenue and back? You know, so it was a kind of a geographical problem. But I was walking on Grand Street one day shopping, I'd say about two years ago. And I happened to say, oh, I think I'll go get some stamps over at Lommer, the little postal service there. So instead of walking along Lommer, I walked Leonard. And I was so shocked. There was St. Mary's. There was no scaffolding yet. There's a, actually, it's covered in netting now. Mm-hmm. And I looked in the upper window, and there was no glass pane anymore, no stained glass. And I saw the rafters and the complete skeleton of the church. And all of a sudden, it's like these little moments come back to you when you, when you get older. It's so weird. It's like the whole scene got recreated. Everybody singing, going to Holy Communion, the parishioners, the people we knew, the people who were dead. It was like all these ghosts were in there. And I thought, it's gone. That time is gone. And I continued to look at it. It was a lot of debris on the sidewalk. And then a year later, somewhat like last year, a year and a half ago, I was with a friend, and I was walking around to show this friend the church, what it looked like now. And this man was in the schoolyard. And I remember my memories of the schoolyard were like, wow, we have this big schoolyard and all the classes are lined up. And when I came back from California and happened to see the schoolyard, I said, where's the schoolyard? They said, this is a schoolyard. It's between the church and the school. I said, this is our schoolyard where we lined up? I mean, it was really tiny. Just so much smaller. Oh, my God. I was like, how how could eight classes get in here? (laughs) So this man was in the back, and it's a very big space. It's the church, the schoolyard, the rectory, the convent, and the school. So it's like a half a block all around. And he said condos would be going up. And, you know, we need affordable housing. We need good things. But it broke my heart. It was really weird. Yeah. And that's everywhere. That happens to everybody in their life everywhere. But my, there was really a, a great sadness on the, my parents' generation because they raised their kids on St. Mary's. Right. Yeah, you know, I I grew up in smaller mm-hmm. places, uh-huh. you know, and, and in smaller places, obviously, these things still happen, but the places kind of stayed the same a little bit, you know, like you expect, like, churches and schools and houses to still be there in 50 right. years because they don't develop as fast. But, you know, the, the, the idea of keeping your community together in a city is it makes so much it makes so much sense and yeah uh, but it, it, it's so hard here. it's much harder yeah but, but it stayed together for a really long time yeah i mean here you know i, I guess the community ties were i mean the way you describe them it, it seems mm-hmm. that way but they were so strong that you know there was that genuine interest in uh, they yeah you know the the, the festival things that right. you all participated in that right. like gave gave 
the community <clears throat> these this sort of cent- center to kind of unite around seems like it really well, worked. Well, I mean, my uncle was the uncle I'm taking care of now is 92. He was born in 1921. Mm-hmm. So from about 1930 at least, they were on Power Street. Mm-hmm. And they, they, my uncle and my aunts told me that they had moved around a lot because my grandmother had five children. And they were making noise all the time and they would get around. But, the, you know, it was like, I don't know, $30 for a month for five people to live, seven people to live in a place. That was probably like really high class, five a month. <laughs> and I remember them telling me that my grandparents were so happy when they bought the house on Powers. And that was 1935. They paid $5,500 and they had to take a mortgage out. Isn't that amazing? Right. That's why my uncle and my uncle's brother, who lives in Florida, my other uncle, they don't believe it when I tell them what housing prices are like. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone wants to come to Williamsburg. Right. And they don't know that everyone didn't want to come here a long time ago. They don't know what it was like. Right. Um, the other thing was about winter time. Like people weren't out as much in the streets in winter time. But I was thinking, what you know, what was my memory if I saw the people out in the spring and the summer? And sometime in the autumn. And then I remembered everybody was in their windows. There was all these old ladies sitting at the windows. One old lady in one house, another one, and they would be just be sitting there. Sometimes an old man, sometimes cats, dogs. But there was a lot of, like, you could see a lot of people sitting in the window, looking out. Not, you know, like, sitting inside. So you still had that evil eye upon you? <laughs> <laughs> Even in the window? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um... I'm just looking at my notes to see. Oh, yeah, Christmas decor, too. There's there's some now, but everybody decorated their windows. Uh-huh. It was an elaborate time for me and my aunts. We really had to think about what window we were going to do this year, and we got it all, all creativity flowing, and then um, we spent a lot of time doing the windows. There were lights up. You left them up till after 12th night. It was, you know, Santa was riding his sled on lights from one side of the street to the other. Mm-hmm. It was very... Everybody walked around looking at everybody's windows. It was a very popular thing to do. There's some decorations now yet, but nothing like it was. And I wonder why that stopped, why that diminished, you know? I don't know. I mean, there's so many people in the neighborhood that are just passing through, I guess. No, but it stopped before the new wave. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, when I lived on the north side, I was teaching at a college, and... It was an intense schedule because it was a lot of traveling for me and it was also a lot of classes and paperwork. So I devised a system where I would just work three days a week. I could afford it. And so the other two days I was off and then the north side had just become popular. There was no art gallery anywhere that to be seen. It was all underground art. It was all like in people's homes or basements mm-hmm. and, you know, it comes on factory. But nobody knew, there were no signs that said art gallery. It was really early on. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of, it's intriguing to be here for the whole change because you could see how it was developing. And there was a saturation point where I thought, this is perfect. Don't change anymore. But you know that's not going to happen. All right. Um, and I remember coming out of my house, walking around the corner to Bedford Avenue, and two women were sitting out, old time as people had been there. And after I passed them, I didn't know them, and I didn't say hello or anything. And after I passed them, they went, hmm, artist. <laughs> and I thought, you are so wrong. <laughs> but I was home during a weekday. And I was, you know, I guess had a Soho look about me. I don't know what was going in their minds, but... I thought, wow, you know, there was a little bit resentment because young people were starting to come in and things were changing, and change is scary. Yeah, you know, I I really want, I I can't figure out exactly how to ask what I want to ask, but I I think it's really interesting. You know, you have this particular vantage on the history of this neighborhood and the Mm -hmm. culture of this neighborhood Mm -hmm. and an appreciation for it that comes out in the way you speak about it that I think must have been influenced by the fact that you, you know, you left and went out to the West Coast and then came back. Right. And I guess... Absolutely. And I want to ask sort of, you know, you know, what made you want to come back and then what, you know, what, what it was that you remembered so vividly about being here. Well, when I was growing up, I didn't like the neighborhood, even though my memories are so fond now, 
because I was suffocated. You know, everybody had to be the same way, and everybody had to get the house on the block, and everybody had to get married at 18, and it was boring. I was very adventurous. I remember going with a friend to George and Harold's, <laughs> a little store on Grand Street that sold cards and coloring books and stationery, and we were buying coloring books. And sure enough, she picked, like, the one with the princesses getting married, and I picked the one of the travel going all around the world, foreign lands, mm -hmm. you know. And I thought back later on, I think she got married young. She had, you know, about five kids. And I traveled everywhere. And it's in you when you're young, and it manifests in these little ways that you don't think about, like buying coloring books. Right. Which one you do? Which one do you choose, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and you became so a travel agent. I became a travel agent. I traveled a lot, and... I, went, I, mean, I remember when I first went to Europe and I went to Africa on a safari that was part of my company, you know. And um, I didn't think anything of it. When you're younger, you don't think about these things. You just think everything is fantastic and adventurous. When you're old, you think, oh, those men in the balcony at Nairobi Airport with the machine guns could have killed me by, by accident. <laughs> it's very interesting how you change. And along with the pulling back from a lot of what you would have gone forth with and, you know, the new fear. Like, people, when they get older, get more fearful and more timid. I mean, luckily, I'm fighting against that. But not everybody, but I think many people do. Um, you're invincible when you're young. But along with the pulling back is such a deep appreciation for what my parents gave me and all those sacrifices. And you see things so differently. And just the culture and what it, you know, I mean, what is it, Tom Brokaw is the guy who coined the phrase, the best gen the greatest, the greatest generation. generation. Mm -hmm. And when I went to France in 2011, I did, I think I mentioned I did a study of World War II for four days at the landing beaches. Oh, my God, I was so choked up. And it was such an incredible time. And I thought, that was my parents' generation. My uncles went to that war. My father went to that war. And I remember going to the cemetery with my father before he died recently, about 2009, and he um, started praying aloud. I never heard my father do that, you know. And he said, um, I'm here with my daughter, God. It was so sweet. And he said, thank you for everything we have and getting me through the war. I was like, oh, my God, the war was in the 40s, and he was still thinking about how he survived it. So your father was Yeah. The I was just amazed. And then I did the study of the war afterwards. And it was a great generation because they were not well off. They struggled all the time. And yet they had these a commitment to certain things, certain values. And they, you know, they sacrificed for their kids. And they got through... You know, they fought Hitler. It was just amazing. Yeah. Average people. So I really appreciate the neighborhood now and the history and, the, and my place in it at that time. And I like what's happening, mostly. Um, I love it, you know, from friends and I saying, Starbucks is coming, I don't believe it. Whole Foods is coming, I don't believe it. Like, yeah. everything is coming to us. Whole Foods is coming? I didn't, uh -huh, I didn't yeah. know that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's kind of amazing because when – it's hard to understand if you're here now, if you're a newcomer now, it's hard to understand that you didn't have anything here. You had grocery stores. You didn't have any form of entertainment. There were no – well, that's not true. There were movie theaters that we went to when I was younger, quite right. a few. But then they all closed, and then you had nothing again. And – Manhattan has everything, and so we always looked with great desire over there, but we were like the little people over here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Betty Smith was talking about in the yeah. book. Um, and I don't know exactly what other people were feeling. I think some people were more content just being with their families. But, you know, for me and my friends, we were always like, let's go to the Metropolitan Opera, let's go to the Metropolitan Museum, and all those kind of things. And it was just like, oh, my God, we got to go back to Brooklyn, be riding on the subway on the L train. It's like, First Avenue came. Everybody interesting is getting off now. We're just going to be the Brooklynites going back to that stupid neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> the new people don't believe this because it's such a different feeling. Everybody's yeah. like, wow, we're going to Williamsburg. 
And now if I tell people I live in Williamsburg, they go, oh, Williamsburg, oh. And they perk up. They perk up, definitely. Yeah. And once, when I first got back from California, I mentioned that, and somebody said, oh, do you live at a loft? I was like, no, I live in a house. <laughs> the same. Yeah. So you asked me what brought me back to Williamsburg. Yeah. I was in California, and I missed the Northeast. I had my five years you missed of sun. the seasons, I guess. I missed the seasons terribly. Yeah. So this winter has cured me of that. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but I I don't know what brought me back specifically. I guess poverty. I guess I just thought, well, I better go back home because there's nowhere else to go right now. Yeah. I did my California thing. This was 86 when you came back? Um, oh, 80, December. I took a Greyhound bus cross country. Okay. December of 82, I ended up back home. 83, I was at home, 84, well, I was at home till 85, the end of 85, and then I heard about this fabulous apartment, which I tell about oh, right. in the article, That's what it was. and that was the beginning of 86, right. and then I had that apartment for 13 years when I got evicted, and that was shocking, but I looked at it very wholesomely and said, this is the time to move on, this right. is the way it is because of the gentrification, you know, I'll do something better with it. So what I like about the neighborhood is all the wonderful stores and the new young people, and it's got a vibrancy, and it's safe, and it's fun. Um, but what I don't like are the rents and that people are getting pushed out. Right. And that if you have to leave an apartment, like I know someone in the neighborhood now who grew up with me, and she's con- concerned because there was a death in the family and that eventually that house will be sold. And when that house is sold, where is she going to go? Because if you have a decent rent, yeah. you're not going to ever get that rent again. Yeah. No, you know what? I I this yeah. is a, I hadn't written a note down for myself. I read your mm-hmm. I read your article and mm-hmm. uh, Catherine's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, this one in the yeah. in the green line that you wrote about Catherine and you. Right. Uh, I mean, you refer to like like a Catherine call, like a cattle call, you know, <laughs> right? And like that. Those those right. ha- those halcyon days. And uh, and she has a. a a statement, I guess, that you, you quote her on, you know, mm-hmm. where she just says she's just looking for good tenants. Yes, she always would she, say that. Right, not interested in making the money off of the property, but finding good people and, right. and housing them mm-hmm. and she bringing them into the community. Exactly. And I guess that's what I focused on in, in your article, that this mm-hmm. is what you're talking about there, mm-hmm. is that, you know, there yes. was, you could count even on the property owners to kind of, you know, that were loaning or renting out the place to kind of make sure that they were building a community and mm-hmm. they felt a part of that from right. their side. And I guess that is kind of missing when you when you bring developers into the mix because yeah. it's really just about... It's just about making money mm-hmm. and they, you know, to have an illegal apartment was unheard of. You wouldn't do that. You know, when by that I mean it's not up to code right. or you take something and you make it into an apartment when right. it really isn't, you know... An apartment, and it was just Catherine's building is definitely a community. Mm-hmm. I said in the article, you meet her in the hall, you're chatting, and right. she goes, "Oh, we'll come for tea, and we'll do this." It was just friendship and family right away, right. and that was precious. And when I wrote the article, I told her I was going to write this article. I thought I want to do this for her before time goes by, and I thought the same thing about Chick because you don't know. And Chick died like six months after I wrote the article. So I was glad I did that. But um, she sent me the picture, and I put it into the editor. And she didn't sound so ecstatic about it. She was like, okay, fine. <laughs> I think she didn't absorb it, and she was sort of surprised. And then when I sent it to her, all hell broke loose, and she sent it all over the country. <laughs> and everybody's saying, oh, that's a great article. Boy, does she know you. She's got you down pat and all yeah. those things, you know. Yeah, it's... You, you do a great job, you know, I think. Well, it was all there. Out. Yeah. It was just like all those memories were there, and cutting the phone wires was <laughs> the best. She never got upset. Yeah. I think that's so funny. That you did. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, this is so ugly. All these old wires painted over. I said, I'm just going to rip the whole thing out. <laughs> I ripped all the wires out. I sanded it. I repainted the bathroom. And when she said, and my phone was gone. My phone was dead. And I told her, my phone said, and she was, oh, well, the guy is going to come. I'll let him in. He'll probably have to go to the bathroom. I said, why does he have to go into my bathroom? And she said, well, that's where the phone wires are. And I went, <gasps> And I was so embarrassed, and then I have to tell my landlady that I cut all the wires in, in this apartment. <laughs> she was a phone company employee. All of she, was, she thought it was a riot. 
Yeah, well, you She's know, so I, easy going. When I read it, it's funny because I think this is a difference between you and I. I I thought, oh, there's those wires there, like that. They must they must be there for a reason. Otherwise, they wouldn't right. be so well, ugly. Well, that's logical. Yeah, but but I would never. I just also I wouldn't think that I I could make something ugly more beautiful. I guess like, <laughs> I just think like as a tenant, I just I'm stuck with it. Kill but like I like that quality though, you know. And yeah. I wonder when when it's they were, audacious, when I they repaired know. it, was it nicer after they repaired it? Wasn't so I, they didn't put any wires in the bathroom. I don't know where the wires oh, went. So I have no them. idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was a big deal over a minor problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, she brought community, and she was wonderful, and she's in Texas now. And oh, okay. When I told her about this project at the library, she was like, my article's going to be in the library? Oh, my God. Well, I said, well, we'll see, you know, <laughs> but now she's on tape a little bit. Of yeah. That is on tape. Um, and that was the north side, right? Yes. That's, okay. Yeah. And now that's just, that's probably where the whole food is probably going to be. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, because yeah, the north side still is much more expensive and much more uh, populated. Bedford Avenue's packed. Yeah. Well, it's now it's the, the equivalent of like First Avenue, I guess. Mm-hmm. In Manhattan. Exactly. It's Bedford first Avenue Brooklyn, looks but... like Manhattan now in terms of the amount of people walking the street all day long. Right. Yeah. Well, so I don't. Yeah. I don't mean to you know backtrack, but I realize right. I don't think I've asked you you know really what your father did for a living. Oh uh, yeah. You know. My father... Your uncles and aunts that were all in the area, too. Right. They were all working class. My father had a series of jobs when he was younger. He told me, I think, as a uh, wine store salesman and... Oh, gosh, again, he was an insurance salesman. And then when he was about 40, he started working for Smith Barney. My mother was... Um, well, she was a mom. She didn't work when we were born. But mm-hmm. before that, she and her sisters, her my two aunts, were seamstresses and factories, basically. And they all, what was so fascinating about it is, is that they had these really menial jobs that they weren't connected to, but it's what they knew, and they got money for it. Mm-hmm. But they didn't look that way. They looked so polished. If I see, show you pictures of my aunts, and I'm sorry everything's packed away, yeah. but... They always had, like, white gloves on and little hats and gray coats. And my, my sister was looking at it recently. She said, how come they dress so beautiful when they were just, like, ordinary poor people? <laughs> my mother, too, they're very stylish. So they had this kind of idea that you just do the best you can. And my grandmother made wine in the bathtub during Prohibition. <laughs> <laughs> and, she, and she was such a religious person. Uh-huh. And... My grandfather, her husband, my this is my maternal grandparents, was a garbage collector at the time when there were no bags. So they were much more ecologically minded. You did not throw any garbage in a bag and right. then put it in the can. You just threw your garbage in the can. They emptied the can in the truck and then they stepped on it. <laughs> now there's a job for you. Right. And so that was that. My father's parents... My father's father owned a factory, a brass works factory. I don't know if he owned it, but he was high up in there. And he... Um, in, in the city somewhere? Or? I have no idea where okay. it is. Isn't that terrible? No. I don't think it was the city. Oh, my uncle was a machinist in the city, my mother's brother. Mm-hmm. And my other uncle was very good in, with office work. He was like a great record keeper. So he worked for you know different companies as a manager, an assistant, you know, that kind of thing. And my maternal, my paternal grandmother didn't work, as far as I know. So they were all working class, all basically factory workers. And it's so interesting that you do have now, I think, there is a certain stereotype or connotation about that. Like if you're a factory worker, you haven't really upgraded yourself, and you're, it's a menial job, and you feel sorry for people who work in factories. But really, that's what keeps everything going, all the goods that factories make. I mean, in China, your factory workers are producing everything. But it was a step up, it right? I mean, it was the, the move into cities and mm-hmm. urbanization. Everything. Right. That was a move off of, like, you know, sort of the farm, poor yeah. farming right. situations, right? I, right. My, I know that my mother's father's mother, uh, she, my mom is... She was just recounting the story when I was home this past weekend, but, like, mm-hmm. she lost 
the tips of a couple of her mm, fingers working really? in like a textile factory. But she was really proud of it, you know, and, and proud of proud of the work she did, and you know, proud of being able to get a job, you know, mm. or, you know. Well, right. And then getting uh, a job. Was that precious. was back in England before they oh, came over over here. But anyway, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it was. I mean, not. My, I come from similar stock, I think. Right. And my mother is very fond of saying we come from good peasant stock. Right. <laughs> or whatever, you know, or people would say that. People. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's yeah. so interesting how the peasantry, if you want to call it that, the people of the country who are farmers have this connection to the land, know how to grow food, you know, and are looked down upon by the snooty city people. Mm-hmm. And then those city people want to move to the country. You know, of course, it's probably a second home or, right. you know, a... It's not, they're not going to farm, but it's like to be a gentleman farmer is admired. Right. So it's really about having money. Right. It's not about what job you do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if you're wealthy and you live in the country, you're a gentleman farmer or yeah. you're a lord. And right. if you're poor, you're a peasant. <laughs> right. well, whatever you can buy, whatever makes you comfortable. I guess. The thing that I take away with the most from my family's generation and that time I admire it tremendously because I'm always all over the place and I'm always wanting more things and maybe I'll do this, maybe I'll do that. And they're good things. It's good to be broad-minded and to be adventurous. I'm not knocking myself, but I'm so different than my family members. And my aunts were so happy to be in their life. Let's go to Manhattan was a big deal. They'd buy a hair curling iron. I was like, every day they bought something new. And that was it. That was their life. They didn't think about going to Europe. They didn't think about having a house of their own, leaving the family nest. And, you know, they were older. They didn't think if they weren't married, they stayed at home. If they got married, then they stayed close to home. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You know, and it was, like, very simple. The decisions were made for you. You didn't have to, you know, kind of, like, pursue these things on your own. And I remember my sister, she's married and lives in the Midwest, and she was having some guests of her husband, this couple who were coming from Oregon, and they never called. And they were supposed to have arrived, and they didn't show, and they didn't call. Then they called, and they said, we might be you know, arriving tomorrow, we're not sure. And she was up in arms because she had you know, gotten their room ready and gotten everything ready, and she said, when we were growing up, people came at 2 o'clock, and they brought a cake, and they left at 3.30, and you knew what to expect, and they weren't driving you crazy. She said, now, I don't know when, when they're coming, I don't know how long they'll stay, and I don't know what's get. So she felt like there was too many unknowns, and she couldn't prepare like the way she wanted. <laughs> and I thought there's something good about each of those things, and there's something annoying about each of those things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I mean, it's so funny because, you know, I think about this all the time, you, now that we all have cell phones and everything, mm-hmm. and everything is, you know, presumably so precise down to the moment, you know, because mm-hmm. you call. I'm five minutes away. I'm like three blocks right. away. Whatever, but right. but then, but there's no exa- There's no more faith in, in yourself. Well, yeah, there, you know, there's no more like trust placed in just making an agreed upon meeting time and being there. You know, mm-hmm. like it, it's mm-hmm. terrifying That's a good point, to people Eric. now yes. that like you know to say like oh, okay. Like, I'll, it's, it's tomorrow, I'll be there at 3 right. p.m. or something like that. You right. call or I'll three meet, or four I'll, times. I'll meet you in a month. Right, exactly. Can you imagine that? And yeah. Then, and you don't call me until we meet. <laughs> right, or yeah, if you're traveling from, from Oregon, like, yeah. you know, or something like that. Like, oh, yeah. well, we're going to set out on this journey on this day, and we'll be there by this day. Yeah, right. I don't know. Anyway, but yeah, like, it's right. just, it's the, it's the exact opposite of what the technology would kind of suggest that it was promising mm-hmm. us, but... The, the outcome is, is the opposite. Well, I mean, bringing the cake is lovely and having them stay a short time is nice. Mm-hmm. But then what if you forget the cake, you know? Mm-hmm. You've created a social indiscretion. Right. It yeah. shouldn't be that important. Yeah. You know, or what if you really want to talk more and you feel like it's you're taking up too much of their time? So there's all this propriety and right. rules, and then the other extreme's no good either. And yeah. to have it in the middle is kind of a real balancing act. Exactly. I think we're kind of in that in the middle stage now, kind of where the you do? well, the I, I think the decorum's not quite set anymore. And no, and, and a lot of different things too. Not just about you know, or not just about decorum, but a lot of different ways that people are living now. Uh-huh. Like they just aren't. They just there isn't an agreed upon code anymore. Like right. Some people live by one. Some people live by another. You're never really right. sure 
I guess right. it's, it's like more confusing. Knows, yeah. I think we're kind of heading toward the opposite direction of like no planning. Yeah. Now, if you're just going to meet somebody for a dinner, that's not a big deal. You know, like, you don't have to plan that out tremendously. But it's kind of like, you know, it'll get taken care of, or we'll see. And before you saved, though I wasn't a very good saver, but, you know, you saved money or you just thought about things that, how other people were affected by it. Though I'm sure this is a generalization. I'm sure there were people in the 50s and 60s who didn't think of anything except for themselves. I guess so. <laughs> it has to I be the same through every yeah. time period. But I know, what you're, I know what you're talking about, though. Yeah. I, and, and just like a considerateness that, well, I don't want to like, bash my generation or <laughs> whatever. And I'm, and I'm sure it's just like you said, there are plenty of people who, who live this way. But I think about these things sometimes, too, uh-huh. just myself, you know. Like, how it's possible to operate without, like, consideration for, like, right. your, how your behaviors will impact the people right. around you. And maybe, perhaps, that's one of those things that was lost by not having, not moving in and out of community structures, I guess, that were... Yeah, there. community really holds a lot together. Yeah. And, and then there's reminds- freedom. We want freedom, and I certainly did. I wanted freedom out of my community. Yeah. Because I wanted to lead. I wanted to do my own things. Mm-hmm. And they weren't against the community. They were just, you know, more worldly things. Right. But then, I, you know, I think back and I think now, as I'm older, community is everything. Because I've lost people. I've lost people, you know, family members, my parents, everything that I know, my church, my school. You know, it's all going. It's all into memory. <laughs> yeah. So then you start to say, well, that was a really special time. I didn't like it then, but I love it now. <laughs> yeah. Well, but you because you know, you're living it then. But you're you're, yeah, and you're, you are who you are. Like you exactly. know, if you have to, if you have to explore and go right. go free. Oh yeah, I was definitely an explorer. Yeah. I mean, I was a girl who was brought up on the Bengal lands. I was brought up on adventure, you mm-hmm. know. And I was a tomboy. I used to have a cowgirl outfit, and <laughs> you know. Yeah. Anyway, it's just. I think it is what it is, like this neighborhood now. It's got great, like like Dickens is beginning to tell the two cities, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. I love that, because yeah. each time period holds both of those things in it. Do you have more quotes for me? Well, no, I just... Uh, <laughs> oh, it's late. Yeah, let me see. I, uh, I want to, I actually kind of really curious to hear... How, how your I, well how your how your parents met I guess I I'm, I wasn't I oh they lived around kind of, oh, okay yeah did, did but it's still going. oh okay is that okay fine. yeah that's fine do you have a couple more minutes sure okay sure yeah um there was no I don't think there was any big deal they lived around the corner from each okay. other so my we, mother used to tell me stories about that she and her best friend used to look at all the boys in the neighborhood and chase them. And then when the boys responded in any way by looking at them or whistling, they'd run away. <laughs> so cute and coquettish mm-hmm. and innocent. Uh, but my mother loved my dad's looks and everything and the way he dressed and all that kind of stuff. But they and, met before the war, I guess, growing up around. Um, that's a good question. I guess they must have known each other because they were in the neighborhood. But Whether not they married dated. Until after. No, they mar- no, they married in January of 51. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that was later. But I guess they must have known each other from pa- possibly from childhood if they saw each other. They were like, you know, a stone's throw. Mm-hmm. But, but were they both born in Brooklyn? Yeah, they were both born in Brooklyn. And um, my grandparents are from the south of Italy, both of them. Nola is this way. Uh, not, they're not from Nola. No, my grand, my father's parents are from Tijano, and a lot of people in the neighborhood who are from Tijano who have been there tell me a lot about it. It's a twelve city district. Okay. <laughs> so Tijano is the district, and Tijano is one of the cities or areas or towns or whatever you want to call it. And there are twelve of them in a circle, a circular pattern, I think, and. Um, I've never been there, so I don't know what it's like, but they say it's lovely. And my grandmother's, my mother's grandparents were from Palma Campania, Palma de Campania, which is near, about two hours outside of Naples. 
I don't know if I told you this, um, when I was in Italy for the first time in 2012, no, 2013 last year, in May. Oh, just a year ago, wow. Um, I was eating in a restaurant in the hotel, and you had to buy your water. So I paid, and I had to put your name and room number, and the waiter saw my name, and he said, you're Jafoni? I said, yeah, your phone. <laughs> and he said, that's a popular name here. And I was like, I kind of knew that. And I said, I know, because my parents have their families from here. And said, oh, I wanted to see the town so badly when my grandmother was born. Mm -hmm. And her last name is the name of a whole district of Italy, one of the counties. And I thought, oh, this is so interesting, and I know so little about it, and I don't know if there's any relatives there now. But I couldn't go. I had no time. I was with the group, mm -hmm. with the children. And also, what am I going to do? Just wander the street saying, do you know so-and-so? You know. But I think it would be something interesting to plan out, you know, kind of maybe try to do research and then write ahead. But... Um, yeah, so they were both Southern Italians, and they they met in the you know in the street, I guess. <laughs> That's yeah. nice. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, and that makes sense too. Like, like it was the community that like right. brought you into this world. <laughs> like, it was. You yeah, know, it would make sense that it would stay important. Yeah. How often does your do your brother and sister get back to the? Oh, my brother lives here. Oh, that's right. And, yeah, but your sister's in the Midwest. My sister's in the Midwest. She tries to come every two years, if not more. They, you know, there's a lot they do. They know she has a grandchild, and I have a great niece, and it's fun. And um, he has a great story. They stay in a hotel because we don't have the space for six or seven people, now seven. So, oh, gosh. <laughs> so um, they rented an apartment on Bethune and... Oh, what's that other popular street? Um, it's in the village. It's not on Bethune. It was off Bethune, Bang Street. Mm -hmm. And she said, I, me and my brother went to visit them when they came in, and then they came here. And we had dinner. So she said, I want you to come up and see the apartment and see what you think. Now I'm thinking back. You know, they're coming back. History is recreating itself. I'm the aunt, and I have a little great niece, and how my aunts and uncles were so generous to us, and so forth. So it was really interesting to think back. I'm having all these thoughts. I go up to the apartment, and it was like a great apartment for one person. It was a three-bedroom, but each of the bedrooms are really small. You can just fit a bed in it, and one you can fit a dresser in. Mm -hmm. And there was a living room kitchen together that was really small. Like you got sofa, and then you had your table and chairs and stove. That's it. So it wasn't architecturally gorgeous, but it was neat, clean, and functional. Yeah. And they were paying 5000 for the week. Gosh. And I was like, oh, my God. Now, this was the only apartment in the building that was, you know, quote-unquote transient. It was like a hotel apartment. Uh -huh. So she told me everybody else rents on a monthly basis. This is their permanent apartment. So when we were leaving the apartment, this guy was putting the key in the door across the hall. So I kind of like was silly and I said hi you know can I ask you a question and do you live here and do you rent by the month or the week because my relatives are just visiting and so he was nice and I said can I ask you what you pay and he said six I said six dollars a month that's great you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I was trying to process it uh -huh. and I don't know if he had roommates but six thousand a month Jeez. And I thought, oh, my God, that's more than the building on Power Street where my grandmother bought. Right? Oh, yeah. It's more money in one month. And I thought things, no wonder Williamsburg is so popular now because it's close to Manhattan and it's not 6000 a month. It's 3000 a month. It's not 6000 right. a month. I don't know. Well, it's I'm, way out. Yeah, but we should stop. It's way over. Oh, gosh, yeah. That's right off the list. Thank you so much. No, listen, Lucille, it was the, just wonderful talking oh, to you. Oh, good. Well, I hope I shed a little light on everything <laughs> uh, yeah absolutely i mean i i feel like i could just continue talking well it's for, fun yeah. it's fun to reminisce it is yeah well but yeah thank and you and you've had such great comments oh yeah know. well i mean well thank you um yeah. but yeah i'm gonna, i guess i'm gonna stop it now. okay